Mataji, please accept my humble obeisances. All goes to Prabhupada. Thank you so much for the blissful kirtan. Really enjoyed it. We now introduce His Grace Radhanath Bhatta Das to uh, introduce the Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhu, welcome to our program. Please accept my humble obeisances. All goes to Prabhupada. Prabhupada Ji, you need to uh, unmute yourself. You can hear me now? Yes, probably we can hear you. Hare Krishna, welcome. 
So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Gauru Premi Devi Dasi. Uh, she joined in 1994 and is a second initiated disciple of His Holiness Shila Indra Swami. She's a medical doctor and have obtained a, an MBCHB degree from Walter Sisul University and has specialized in general surgery from the Colleges of Surgeons of South Africa. She is currently completing a master's degree in medicine from the University of the Witwatersrand with a focus on women's health, endocrine surgery and cancer prevention. Her work with undergraduate teaching was recognized with an award from the university in 2020. She's a member of the South African Impact Group of Devotee Doctors and the International Bhaktivedanta Medical Association, providing voluntary medical services to devotees in South Africa and across the world. She serves as a pujari at the Sri Sri Nitai Gaur Hari Mandir in Lanesha where she also engages in leading kirtan, cooking, baking, altar, deco, jewelry making, and book distribution services. She has completed the senior certificate Bhakti Gita Diploma and Bhakti Sastri courses, and she's currently studying the Bhakti Vaibhav course to the Bhakti Vedanta Vidya Pita Classical Sanskrit, Classical Sanskrit to the Central Sanskrit University, Classical Indian Music with Ninda, Ninad School of Music. And she's an amateur archer with the Archer Archery Club. So this is Gora Premi Devi Dasi, also known for many, many years from the time she joined. I met her when she was about nine, I would think. And at 11 years, uh, she gave a talk in the temple. And two swamis were hearing her the spiritual master, His Holiness Indra Dumna Swami, and uh, Mukunda Maharaj, who came here very few times. Maybe people probably don't know too much about him. And they were seated and they were, she was also answering questions and she was very young then and she was very brave and she'd done many, many service in many, many areas, plays, dramas or whatever, you know, with, the, uh, with a very vibrant group we had at that time. So we hand over to you to speak on your topic today and please feel free to ask your questions uh yeah okay thank you Hare krishna thank you so much Hare krishna Prabhu, we request some closing comments from you as well we really appreciate your, okay. your comments Hare krishna thank you Prabhu. okay thank you you can't hear him i just can't hear um, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Much for the kind words. It's all been inspiration for you. Um, so Hare Krishna, everyone. All glories to Shri Prabhupada for the amount of messages. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak on this very important topic. Um, I pray for all your blessings in order to do justice to it. So we're going to speak from Bhagavad Gita today, chapter 4, verse 10. Vivaraka Pyabhya Manmaya Mamupashita Bhagavadyan Chakasa Bhutamad Bhavam Arta. The translation. Being freed from attachments, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me and taking refuge in me. Many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and thus they all attained transcendental life. Um, so I'm going to read the purport of a different verse because Sri Prabhupada explains a little more about the topic that we're going to discuss today in this purport from Sri Prabhupada. This is Canto 7, Chapter 1, verses 28 to 29. So he says, there are two ways of constantly thinking of Krishna, as a devotee and as an enemy. A devotee, of course, by his knowledge and tapasya, becomes free from fear and anger and becomes a pure devotee. Similarly, an enemy, although thinking of Krishna inimically, 
thinks of him constantly and also becomes purified. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 30, where the Lord says, Api chet sudura chavari, pati de maavana chaha, sadureva samantabhya, samyat vyaga samantisaha. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he engages in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated. A devotee undoubtedly worships the Lord with rapt attention. Similarly, if an enemy always thinks of Krishna, he also becomes a purified devotee. Lord Krishna appears within this material world for two purposes. Karitranaya sadhuna vinashaya chandrushkita to protect the devotees and annihilate the demons. The sadhus and devotees certainly think of the Lord always. But the Dushkritis, the demons like Hansa and Kusapa, also think of Krishna in terms of killing him. By thinking of Krishna, both the demons and the devotees attain liberation from the clutches of Hansa. Omagyana Smena Sarasya, Shalaka, Shakti, 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 so um, this theme of overcoming fear is a very important one that comes up uh, mentioned by Krishna and Bhagavad Gita many times. We don't think of fear as negatively as we think of the other vices, like anger and envy and greed. But when we think about how much fear occupies our minds, it actually keeps us from being absorbed in thoughts of spiritual life. It's um, so bad that Prabhupada says in uh, the chapter in chapter five, in the purport, that having uh, fear in our minds hampers our awareness of fear. And we can think that of how many times we get distracted by some fearful thought, and it keeps us from showing attention, from chanting, or to any other spiritual activity that we might be doing. So this symptom of people in Kali Yuga is mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam, the first canto. Mandas Mantra Bhavyo, Manda Kagya Upadvitaha. And Sri Prabhupada explains this word Upadvitaha to mean um, an anxious mind, a mind that's full of anxiety. So in Bhagavad Gita, right at the beginning, when Arjuna is displaying all the qualities of a confused living entity, he also shows fear. And this is very unusual for Arjuna because we know him to be um, the kind of personality who faced so many fearful situations in the past before that battle. And he never displayed fear. So him demonstrating this quality is doing so on behalf of us in order to show us that no matter how deeply um, set our fear is, Krishna's knowledge that he's giving him as Bhagavad Gita is going to dispel that fear. And this transcendental knowledge is going to become the key that we all need in order to overcome fear, the topic that we're going to talk about. So let's try and understand the nature of fear a bit better so that we can understand how knowledge can help us overcome it. So Srila Prabhupada explained in a lecture that he gave on the first and the second chapter of the Bhagavatam that fear comes from us being disconnected from Krishna. So our nature is to be servants of Krishna. And when we forget that eternal constitutional condition and we try to become controllers or enjoyers, then in this material world, which is so full of um, different obstacles to us to enjoy, we become aware of all these threats to our enjoyment, particularly how temporary the nature of enjoyment is. At any point, there's something that's going to hamper our enjoyment of our own bodies, our minds, of other people, and um, of the resources that we have. And the realization of this temporary nature of our enjoyment it's where the fear arises from. It's actually, in a way, our unconscious um, realization that we're not in control of any situation, that whatever happens to us, um, we 
we don't have a way of prolonging our enjoyment in the face of great fear, great anxiety, or great danger. And uh, it makes us wonder why, if we're the controllers of the situations that we can, why can't we make our enjoyment last as long as we can? So therein lies the nature of fear, that unpleasant and complete sense of powerlessness in the face of a dangerous situation, a situation that's totally caught our anxiety, whether it's a threat to our bodies or minds or possessions or people we care about. So within this nature of fear, this great powerlessness is also lying the ability to control it. Because when we acknowledge our powerlessness within this world, we acknowledge that there's a higher power that's actually in control of the nation. And by acknowledging that higher power, we display something called faith. There's a common saying within the material world that your faith must be stronger than your fear. So what does that mean? Um, to us who are spiritual practitioners, faith is the first step on the path to spiritual life. Um, we read in Hakira Sutta, Adho Shraddha Tatu Sadhu Sangha Prabhaji Kriya. When we uh, start on the path to spiritual life, it starts with faith. And faith is um, the kind of, um, the faith is faith is a kind of um, um, it's the beginning of our spiritual life, but it needs to be grown in order for us to overcome our fears. And faith is grown with the next two steps that's mentioned in the verse from um, the Bhakti Shita Sindhu, that is Sadhu Sangha and Padana Kriya. So Sadhu Sangha, the good association of those who have um, strong sadhana, that can motivate us on the spiritual path. And Vajna Kriya is us engaging in hearing and chanting of Krishna's glories um, in addition to all the other spiritual activities that we perform. So how is it that Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha, and Vajna Kriya actually help us to overcome fear? In the beginning of this class, the verse that we quoted from Srimad Bhagavad Gita stated that jnana and tapasa, that is knowledge and austerity, also echoed in that purport by Sri Prabhupada in the seventh canto, that devotees become free from fear by uh, developing their knowledge and by engaging in tapasya or austerity. So we can start by discussing the development of knowledge and all of this in relation to those three steps, Sadhusatta, Sadhusanga, and Vajrakriya. So what kind of knowledge do we need to overcome fear? We need to have sound spiritual knowledge of who Krishna is as a person. That is who he actually is to us. Because also in the material world, we find it hard to trust somebody unless we really know them. And how many times have we said that? That if I don't know somebody, I don't trust them. So if we know who Krishna is, then we can trust him and we can have faith in him to deliver us from all kinds of fear. And we develop that trust in him by reading scripture, and um, hearing from the realized soul, and as well as associating that Sadhu Sangha with those who know him well, who can tell us more about Krishna in a way that will deepen our trust and our faith in him. So that's why we must really look for quality in our Sadhu Sangha, in the associations of the devotees that we take in, in order for it to be beneficial for everybody. If we're going to do social meetups, we're not going to discuss Krishna um, deeply and relish the topics of him. We're going to be uh, distracted by discussing material topics, the weather, or politics, or other things. Um, we're not going to get that strong faith in Krishna that's going to uproot our fears. We have to make sure that our association is very, very strong, um, bringing us that knowledge. And Srila uh, uh, Rupa Goswami, in the nature of devotion, he warns us against um, engaging in this unnecessary talk, this pradalpa, because he says that it actually spoils our spiritual life. He says, Atyahara Pyashasta Pradalpa Niyama And in addition to that, he also mentions that um, through the association of devotees, uh, when we execute another principle, uh, we can utter. When we reveal our mind in confidence to devotees, 
then we can actually get advice on how to overcome fear further. And um, this is the importance of behavior research. So now we come to tapasya, or uh, our social activity. While developing our knowledge of Krishna, we need a fertile ground for this knowledge to take root so that it can destroy our fears effectively. And the way that we do this, the way that we create the groundwork for our knowledge to grow is through devotional service or by prayer. Uh, Srila Prabhupada says in the Krishna book that this um, Krishna consciousness, this devotional service, is actually the ultimate capacity of living. And he has very, very kindly given us um, quite uh, an easy, but um, but also sublime way of executing Tapasya very practically in our lives. So this is by rising early in the morning, taking bath before sunrise, chanting our rounds and reading scripture and hearing the intention, um, following the regulative principles, avoiding the association of materialistic company, and of course fasting when in high sea and other situations. So this kind of strong Tapasya in spiritual life it's purified. It has the ability to make knowledge much clearer to us because it's clearing out, uh, because it's transcendental nature, it's clearing out all the effects of the material nature of life. And by establishing us in knowledge, it helps us to clear out all the anxieties and fears that we have that are unnecessarily taking our minds into position. So um, we will find that in time, our anxiety less and our thoughts will be less. And uh, Krishna confirms this in Bhagavad Gita in chapter 2, uh, text 65. Uh, he says, Kaidunya Shayavi Dhamma Kasya Kavadhamma Nirvana Kasto Nirvana Shayavadhamma Dhamma. He says that by becoming situated in the transcendental life, we can overcome all the anxieties that are associated with these three forms of nature in this material world. And once we're able to do that, then these anxieties won't be troublesome to us anymore. So thus we see that within the steady and sincere practice of Krishna consciousness, we have all the vital ingredients for freeing us from fear and granting us firm faith in Krishna's protection. In addition to that, the Lord has also kindly given us the knowledge of many powerful prayers that we can recite for protection. Sri Prabhupada advises us in the eighth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam that by reading these prayers, reciting them, and by remembering them in particular, um, in addition, of course, to chanting Hare Krishna with attention, um, we can recall them in a moment of danger or need. And um, the example that we have in that same eighth canto is of Gajendra the elephant. Um, Gajendra in his previous life was a great saintly king in Indra, um, who was cursed and was born as an elephant in the region of the spiritual, of, of the heavenly planets called Jikuta. So because this region is so beautiful and he was in such an opulent position with all his family members and friends, he, by his own admission three years later, wasn't so interested in spiritual life. Um, one day, accompanied by all his family and friends, he entered into a beautiful lake, and while enjoying uh, with his uh, wives and his children, he was captured by a crocodile that caught his leg within his mouth. And although he was very strong, this crocodile was within its natural element of the water. So the crocodile was also equally strong, and he couldn't free himself. He fought this crocodile for a thousand years, all the while, his family tried to help him as well, and nobody could extricate him from his danger. So in this condition of life, he suddenly had that remembrance of the prayers that he recited as King Jupiter. And he started um, praying intensely to Lord Narayan with great faith. And because of this, he was able to um, actually call the attention of the Supreme Lord. And the Lord came and rescued him and killed him. So Shri Prabhupada says, therefore, that we should try and learn some prayers. And he advises us, um, some in particular, he advises the Nitya Pranams, which um, all devotees will explain them very well. And there are also many other wonderful prayers of protection. Um, 
that we can decide. Uh, there's the Narayan Kabacha in the city council of Shukran Bhagavatam. And uh, the Nirsimha Kabacha players, which are also about the devotees. There's two, um, one in Kapilas uh, Bhakti, uh, sorry, in Dhamma Samhita, and the other um, from the Brahmanda Purana. And um, I found that in reading these prayers, they're very comprehensive. Um, the uh, Nirsimha Kabachas, they actually cover um, the protection of the body from top to toe. And the Narayan Kabacha, it basically mentions all kinds of fears that you could possibly have. Um, there's even prayers um, that I've come across uh, when one can pray to Lord Narsimhadev if they're afraid of planetary influences like um, from Chani Dekish, which really troubles people. And what I gathered from all these prayers is that the Lord is so merciful to us. He's so understanding of all the conditions that we could possibly be in in this material world that he's granting us prayers that are sometimes so specific, we feel that they were actually written. That is really great kindness. So um, some of us may find it difficult to remember prayers, but um, Pastor Talad Maharaj, he says in Srimad Bhagavatam that just by remembering the auspicious appearance of Lord Nisimhade, we can also be of a great consequence. Um, Talad Maharaj himself is the most extraordinary example of someone who overcame fear because he was put into extraordinarily dangerous conditions, and not just one. He was repeatedly threatened by his father um, with so many um, horrible, fearful situations. Um, he was tortured, he was thrown off a cliff, he was poisoned, he was um, left to endure um, boiling oil and um, freezing cold, and, and many other terrible situations including being subject to his father by directly being threatened. But nothing wavered for Lord Maharaj from his remembrance of the Lord, because that is the great problem with fear. It keeps us away from thinking of the Lord. So um, Talad Maharaj is the ideal example of Vishnu Smaranam for that reason, because he was remembering the Lord in any and every fear So um, we there's also the topic of spiritually related. Those who are on the spiritual path in our life, um, those that uh, are trying to engage in devotional service to Krishna, they may be worried about the effects of their past karma, about um, their present situation of devotional service, and how to optimize and engage the Lord, as well as their future destination of devotional service. So I call these the, uh, the fears of devotional service, past, present, and future, uh, borrowing. So um, Krishna very mercifully addresses all of these fears also with um, beautiful verses from Bhagavad Gita, which are very reassuring in time of fear. In the 18th chapter, he says, Sarvadharma Parityajya, Maamekam Karmakrita, Aham Dvantakaha Mekho, Mokshay Sankhya Suchaha. So if we are so scared of our past sins and the effects they're going to have, Krishna helps us by um, by allowing us to surrender to him so that we can um, forget all these sins, knowing that he's taking care of them. He promises us that we don't have to fear about any of the, the sins. Um, we read that there are four kinds of sins and that um, with the progress of these sins, they can cause a lot of distress for the conditioned souls. But if we um, surrender to Krishna fully, these sins won't have any effect on us and they won't distract us um, from our spiritual life. Then we have um, the fears of the present, and that he addresses in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Ananya Shintiantumam Ye Janaha Paripashite, Tesham Nitya Bhayuktanam, Yoga Kshemam Bahamiyaham. There he says that he will carry to us whatever we need and preserve whatever we have. So if we're fearful of our present services to him, how we're going to improve our services to him in the future, he takes care of that with this promise also. And then the future, he says in the second chapter, Neha Vikrama Nashu Sti Pratyavayo Navidyate Swalpam Ati Asya Bhargasya Rayate Mahalopaya. Then we come to perhaps the greatest fear of the devotee. That is the future of our devotional service. 
what will happen to us if we're not successful in this life? But Krishna assures us that there will be no loss, no diminution, and we will be able to take up from where we left off in devotional service. Devotees never actually fall from any position that they have managed to achieve, and certainly they never fall into the animalistic position or lower forms of life. Um, that fear of what will happen after death, that great unknown that we have to face on our own, that is what really haunts people, what really haunts um, the materialists and the biobodies in particular. Um, Shri Prabhupada makes that point in the verse that our program today is based on. He says that the materialists and the biobodies, they're so affected by this fear that they're going to um, possibly retain the individuality after death then obviously suffer for whatever they've done in life, that they would rather believe that they're going to merge into nothing. It's more comfortable for them to believe that there is no existence after death. So this is also coming from the lack of knowledge. They don't know how to um, prevent falling down into a monster. But the devotee of Krishna can easily overcome this fear. They have to cultivate their knowledge and their faith in Krishna, as we mentioned knowing that Krishna never leaves his devotees alone, that death is not this um, lonely, uh, terrifying state, that um, he will not only be there with us through the process of death, but he will ensure that either we go back to Godhead or we take a birth in a, in a favorable situation so that we can always engage in devotional service to him and ultimately attain him. So, the devotee's relationship with Krishna in the form of death is often explained by Sula Prabhupada as um, the cat. The cat has a kitten in its mouth and it has um, a mouse in its mouth. But the kitten and the mouse don't feel the same uh, feeling. Um, the kitten is feeling protected and the mouse is feeling fear. So in the same way, death to a devotee is still Krishna's protection and uh, death to the materialist is very, very so we can be comforted by these thoughts, remember them often, and um, repeatedly think of them so that we can steer our thoughts away from fear and steer them towards Krishna. In the beginning, it does feel um, very difficult and a bit artificial, but it will become more natural with time um, because of repeatedly um, making our mind think of Krishna with these fearful thoughts come through. And then Krishna himself, seeing our sincerity, he helps us. He helps us actively to overcome those fears. So we also have the examples of, of great devotees um, to inspire us in this regard. We've discussed Gajendra, the elephant, and um, Talad Maharaj. But in the modern sense, Srila Prabhupada, of course, is um, our great example of fearlessness um, in, in the face of great danger. Um, I was meditating on Srila Prabhupada's names during this year's appearance. And um, we know that he was given the title Bhaktivilas Swami because of how erudite his scholars he was. And he was also called Srila Prabhupada because he's the Yugacharya that was feeds all master servants. But in addition, his initials AP stand for a very significant name of his. It stands for Abhai Sarvakare. At birth, Srila Prabhupada was given this uh, name of High Saran, and his spiritual master chose to attain this name um, at his initial. So Abhai Charanaravinda, it means one who is fearless, having taken shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada's fearlessness served him so strongly throughout his life. He survived um, and faced the bombing of Calcutta, uh, the famine, and other social upheavals at the time. Um, he had the fearlessness to leave his family, to take sannyas, to attempt um, to start a worldwide spiritual movement in India against much opposition against him. He also started writing and printing spiritual literature with absolutely no resources and no established audience. And then he had to face the greatest danger of all. He journeyed across the ocean to a completely foreign country and then um, with no, I think he can't believe with no support, almost no money, and no guarantee of success. Now that is some extraordinary odds, and he would have to be utterly fearless, completely um, dependent on the shelter of Krishna's lotus 
Shakti and on the power from the spiritual master's instruction in order to accomplish it all. So that, though, was not the end of the fearful situation. With a growing spiritual movement like ISKCON and all the successes that followed, money, followers, and fame, even the most self-realized person can fall victim to the of power. This is why Lord Chaitanya says, um, he doesn't want to encounter any of the dangers of spiritual life. But Srila Prabhupada was surrounded by it all constantly, yet he always remained steadfast in the face, in the face of any of the dangers that were posed by life. There were also physical dangers that he faced. He was involved in an accident. He had a lot of health troubles. There was cheating from the antagonist. The end, uh, death threat, threats from the and all the political and social attacks on ISKCON, as well as all the schisms within it, the Prabhupada was always fearless. And then at the very end, he was fearless once more in the face of death. And he set the perfect example for all of us to follow. Um, there's a beautiful bhajan that I learned in my childhood that comes to mind in fearful conditions. It reminds me very much of the Prabhupada. No special need for this. It's called uh, Bajan Revo. It's very well known to the devotees. Um, it summarizes all the precarious positions that uh, we have in our material lives and also the solution is fearlessly taking shots at the lotus feet of Krishna by engaging in devotional service and association with saintly persons. And it's also fairly easy to remember. Um, I could sing it now, or maybe there's comments or questions. Um, Hare Krishna, Mataji, thank you for the class. Mataji, the sound was a bit soft. So we, if we can just request uh, His Grace Raghunath Bhatta just to cover a few points that you've spoken. Uh, Prabhu, is it, could you just cover a few points that Mataji mentioned? The sound was a bit soft for those that may have missed out. Um, if, you, if you heard, maybe you heard, you heard some of the points, Prabhu. Just unmute. Can, you, can all of you hear me? Loud and clear, Prabhu. Okay. Uh... Yeah, I think the sound was poor, but anyway, uh, uh, very important points on fear. One was that fear occupies our mind, which you mentioned. And the reason was that for, because we are unconnected from Krishna. Maybe this is one of the points you can bank and, 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 and comment on. This is one of the things. And the other point was you have to know Krishna to overcome fear. And she gave various examples like uh, different type of prayers. She gave the example of uh, different personalities who were under uh, threat, and they were they were you know put into severe conditions uh, by the at least one Pralad Maharaj by his parent Kashipu. and Gajendra was also a very beautiful example which he had given, uh, and you know Gajendra. It was a, a very, very beautiful example. And there are many other examples she gave you know, through prayers. And then she gave the example of how uh, Srila Prabhupada was, you know, he, his name was Abhay Charana Vrinda. He was, he was actually fearless, but he's, he also subjected to so much of threats, fear, worrying about the movement and so much, but he overcame that at the point of death. So in essence, you know, that's what it is. And maybe, maybe we can, she could, you know, so if people want to question her on something, it will be interesting. But if not, then she can uh, talk a little bit about how fear comes from, un, you know, being unconnected from Krishna. So, so that, in essence, in a nutshell, what, what the whole uh, talk was about. Is it okay? Yes, thank you, Prabhu. Uh Mataji, would you, like you like to respond, Mataji? Hi, Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for highlighting yeah. the points. Um, yeah, so um, when we're connected to Krishna um, as his servants, then Krishna affords us um, that kind of protection from fear that we don't get when you take the shelter of Maya. Shri Prabhupada explains that Krishna and Maya Actually, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's explained that Krishna and Maya are opposite sides. Um, they're like light and dark. You can't have Krishna and have Maya. 
So when the living entity is disconnected from Krishna, it means he's automatically um, connected to Maya. And that, is, that uh, situation of being uh, involved in Maya, Sri Prabhupada calls that Durashraya. He calls it false shelter, meaning that Maya doesn't give us any shelter, not from fear or anything else. We're absolutely on our own to face whatever dangers this material world has for us. And that's why everybody is in that condition of fear. Um, like we said from Srimad Bhagavatam, everyone is full of anxieties. Um, the mind is completely not peaceful, in this, um, especially in the state of high fear. So only when we establish our relationship with Krishna, and that connection with him again, then we get the real ashraya, the real shelter. And that is the kind of protection that we desire. Because that protection, it's not just for now, it's not just for this life or um, a certain period of life. That protection is through this life into the next life. As soon as we start our devotional practices, Krishna doesn't let us go. Even if we let go for whatever reason, he's always there guiding us through um, each life that we undergo. Unfortunately, we have to be reborn again. And um, that kind of protection that survives after that, that's not any kind of protection that, that anything in this material world can protect. So that's why it's so important for us to establish that connection with Krishna again, so that we can be under his shelter and be protected under all circumstances. And um, when we get to know Krishna better, we can trust him more, and trust his protection, then um, we give up this fearful condition slowly but surely with all our devotional practices and all our We'll be able to overcome fears. Is that Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madhuji. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Uh, His Grace Raghunath Bhatta, is there any more uh, comments from your side? Maybe you know the the devotees can ask questions and we can we can respond to it. Uh, you know. Uh, okay. Some questions. Uh, there's there's quite a few people. There's Gona Segri, I see. There's Aditi. There's uh, Babs. There's I'm just seeing who's on this on this. Yeah. So maybe others could uh, could ask, and then we could comment a little bit more on. Yeah. Um, I could add something, and she could or she could just answer, and I could add uh, from what she speaks. Yes, maybe we can start off with Babs. You know, Babs, uh, he has always some nice comments to make. Babs, Prabhu, are you there? He's also very supportive of our programs. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, Hare, I Krishna. See. Hare Krishna. Uh, yes, thank you for affording me the opportunity. Uh, I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed the class, Mataji. Very, very, you presented in a very, very succinct manner. Please keep up the good work. And... Uh, Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Gonasegri Naidu Sham, uh, Madhaji Hare Krishna, Madhaji. Was everything uh, okay? Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure why the sound is that low. I didn't quite uh, hear the lecture today. Uh, so my apologies for that. I'm not quite sure if it's on my end. Oh, on your, but I can. I could not hear the lecture. Uh, yes, the sound was a bit bad, Madhuji. Yeah, so but I'm sure it was an excellent lecture, and uh, uh, my apologies for that. But I will, <laughs> I will try the next time. It could be my phone as well. So sorry about that. Uh, well, maybe we can request the Madhuji to also make some notes for us, and we can also send it to you. All. You can give us your details. Uh, Madhuji will give us the main points. Yeah, that's a good idea. Right. Yeah, but his grace, like that, but I just did cover number. a few points. Yeah. You do have my mobile number. I have you. Yes, yes, Madhuji, we, we've uh, got it. And whoever wants to send their email address, I could yes. Give you my email address and you could send it through. And then, you know, I could respond. Um, yeah, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, Thank you good. so much, Madhuji. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Uh, Ravindra Prabhu, is there any uh, comments from your side? Hare Krishna, Ravindra Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Uh, and Hare Krishna, Mataji. Thank you very much for the nice lecture. Yeah, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. 
so much. <laughs> there, there are some new people also online. That, uh, it's, it's so nice to see some new people joining us. Um, like Karuna Shakti, she joined us before. Madhuri Hare Krishna, is there any comments from your side? Mother, uh, mother, yeah. mother. All right. We've got Nikki Budhya also. Um, Rene Budalu. Um, uh, Hare Krishna, is there any other comments from your side? Uh, Nikki Budhya, Hare Krishna. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Madhuji, I think we, we, are, we, we, are, we are done. I don't see any more comments or questions. Uh, probably, is it you like to round off? And Madhuji has some kids and also she wanted to share with us. Okay, yeah, that's good. But uh, just thinking, you know, uh, uh, Guru Premi, you know, you've been, a, you know, you've been, you know, you're a practicing, you're practicing medicine and you've been a doctor and, and still your profession and you, and you, uh, Studying more in medicine, uh, when 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 you when you're dealing with patients in anxiety, uh, what is their fear level? You know how how afraid they are at that point, and what you know how do they can they overcome that? When people are in anxiety, you know, because anxiety is just another disease that is just spreading worldwide. How do you deal with people like that? Because at the time of death, if a person is in anxiety, can be really troublesome for the, uh, you know, for the next birth. So how do you deal with that type of situations? So um, that's a, it's a nice question because it's something that I'm faced with very often. It's true that anxiety is a terrible disease. It's actually... Um, you know, it's a recognized psychiatric disease, obviously, and people need medication for it. It's something that hampers their lives. But, um, you know, anxiety has so many different components. As well. um, it can be um, free floating anxiety that actually doesn't have, uh, just to give a rough idea, that doesn't have any basis. But um, in a surgical practice, I tend to have patients that uh, are fearful because of um, serious diseases the body that they're encountering. And um, a lot of those diseases are uh, like related to cancers and other things that are terminal. So um, in helping patients through anxiety, the things that, um, that matter the most, actually what we're advised constantly as doctors is to make the patient be informed. So this is also um, finding a parallel in our spiritual understanding of having knowledge to overcome um, in the medical context, when we inform the patient um, what is going on with them exactly, uh, from drawing uh, diagrams, because, you know, sometimes uh, like the anatomical idea of it is difficult for them to understand. So we go right down to detail uh, of the disease process and what we're going to do. And that goes a long way to helping patients overcome the anxiety of so many things. Um, I have to convince patients to have surgery, uh, long surgeries, dangerous surgeries. So if I can explain to them that we're going to uh, uh, undertake a procedure that's in a controlled environment, uh, that is with professionals, uh, that has a good success rate, it goes a long way to helping them feel comfortable. Um, and then we have a scenario where there are patients who um, may not survive the disease process, especially if it's a terminal illness. In that case, um, also it's so important that they understand the disease and what's happening to them. And in giving them that idea that um, their disease is not going to afford them a long time uh, to live, it's not cool, but it actually helps them to organize their priorities. And I call these the Marat Parikshit moments, because this is when we realize that life is not as long as we thought it was going to be. And we start to think of all the things that we should rather be doing with. Because people are spending so much of their time um, in useless things. Um, even you know, when they think about the material context, instead of spending their time um, trying to accumulate a lot of money, someone who's in a terminal position will spend more time with their family members. And of course, in the spiritual uh, side of things, we 
definitely become more serious about spiritual life when we're in that terminal condition. So it's always good to have knowledge, um, to understand what is going on with the body so that somebody can, um, can actually take steps in order to prioritize what's important to them in that uh, last uh, stage of life. And um, it's, it's always gonna be difficult as long as they don't have spiritual understanding. Some people are still very peaceful at death, but it goes a long way for some people to have uh, a belief that Krishna is there for them at the time of death. Then they know that they're not gonna be alone. So I think that loneliness is one of the, the significant factors of death. Yeah, I'm just checking, you know, that, you know, you may have dealt with devotees who suffer from anxiety and depression, but they know the philosophy, they have an understanding of the mind, uh, but still they're subjected to this kind of uh, situations where they're anxious about things. Uh, or they, you know, I don't know if anxiety you know, leads to depression uh, or, or anxiety is a lower form of depression. What's the difference between the two and how do you, you know, if devotees, like people who have know the philosophy come to you for some advice, how do you deal with that? Okay, yes, it's true. I think devotees do advice both. And um, anxiety and depression, they actually, um, they can coexist in people. They're called mood disorders, but they're different in terms of how they manifest. So anxiety is, we can understand it colloquially, that state of fear, of imagining all the things that can go wrong and being so powerless um, to do anything about it, that it actually hampers how we live our lives. And that's when it becomes a disease. So we're all in the state of anxiety, but when anxiety becomes a disease, it's when it's stopping us from living our lives normally. So there's a huge spectrum of, um, of uh, anxiety disorders, as we call them. But basically, they're incapacitated. Sometimes people can't work properly. They can't live properly. Um, they can't sleep properly. The anxiety is keeping them up at night. They can't eat properly. Because the, the anxious thoughts are so uh, powerful that um, they're, uh, they're impeding all normal facets of life. So that's, the, that's just... A colloquial explanation of how anxiety manifests itself as an anxiety. And then depression, it can actually coexist with anxiety and depression. But depression is um, a way of thinking of it is an extreme sadness. So it's an extremely um, low mood that we can experience that also becomes a disease when it's impacting the activities of life, like anxiety. So when we're so depressed about them, it can also be like how I said, anxiety is free floating. It may not have its cause. We just feel all these anxious thoughts in our mind without any real reason. Or the anxieties can be set off by something in life. So depression can be the same. People can have these low and depressed moods with no real reason, or they can be low and depressed because something has happened in their lives that's, um, that's setting it off. Like, the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or something. So basically, when they're in these very depressed moods, then they're experiencing the same thing that the anxious person is experiencing. They're not able to function properly, not at work, not at home, not at sleeping, not at anything. So in a nutshell, that's what these diseases are. So um, whenever I'm confronted with anyone who has these, it always helps to get to the bottom of what's causing it. The easiest thing is when I could say easiest, but when they have a trigger, like the loss of the loved one or an anxious state because they're fearing, um, like, you know, the results of an exam or something like that, these kind of things are easier to address because they have some basis and, you know, you can help the person uh, in that individual situation to cope with what they're going through. With the very uh, free floating anxieties or the depression that has no basis, um, what's so important is. Um, to do what I was explaining earlier, to ground themselves in the reality that whatever is happening is just um, a state of the material world. It's not real. And that the reality of Krishna's protection and his mercy in our lives is real. And um, 
these prayers, uh, the chanting, the spiritual activities, they're not just a distraction for people. When we find um, something that someone, because everyone's different, but when we find something that someone who's depressed or anxious can find in a specific activity in spiritual life, whether they are going out and um, engaging in something that's taking their mind off it, like book distribution or food for life, if they're seeing um, the satisfaction on the faces of people that they're serving in these conditions, it goes a long way to making them feel better, um, to keep them amongst happy company, devotees, people who are focused on Krishna, that good association, that also helps. And if their mind is able to focus on something, then helping them hear uh, calming and soothing things like kirtan, and, um, like Prabhupada speaking, because Prabhupada's classes and kirtans, that Shabda Brahman, it has such a powerful effect on the soul. So we can tease out all these activities to find something that that anxious or depressed person will be able to draw strength from. And we can make a program of activities through the day um, for them to be absorbed in and absorbed in and involved in and, um, and help them also to manage things like sleeping and eating better. And it is very possible to treat all these um, conditions, anxiety, fear, depression, um, with these, um, what we call behavioral therapies. It really makes a huge difference. It, it can work. It does work, especially with stress. Thank you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thanks, Thank you so much. Madhuri, thank you so much. I've got one question, if you don't mind, Madhuri. Yeah. Uh, the, the Prabhupada mentioned he, he saw you when you at a very young age in the temple. Uh, Prabhupada, what age did you see the Madhuri? Oh, it's, uh, maybe nine or ten, something like that. I don't know. She yeah, could so, say. Yeah, so I just wanted to know, Madhuri, how did you end up in the temple at such a young age? Huh. And what, what kept you going? You know, at a young age, normally people don't know too much of knowledge, but, you know, something must have been in you that kept you there, you know? How, you what know, motivated you? I didn't meet her at the temple. I met her at a program that was not far from where yes. we lived. She could explain, yeah. Yes, how did you come into the ISKCON, basically? And how did you, what kept you going, you know, so many years? Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, we actually joined as a family in 1994. Um, yeah, I was nine years old at the time. And um, we had a basis in Christian consciousness already. Um, we were very fortunate that my father had been exposed to uh, uh, the establishment of Christian consciousness in the Clarewood area. That was around the late 1970s um, and the early 80s. And um, in addition to that, my father had been a teacher for a long time. So they were very favorable to Christian consciousness, um, although in our, our early years, before nine, um, they weren't um, like actively involved at the time. But, um, this is why Bhagavad Gita so dear to my heart. And, um, I remember the first class uh, that Raghav Swami gave me, and the reason why I actually joined at the time, even before my father allowed us to go, um, was because of Bhagavad Gita. Um, my father had a copy of the 1959 edition of Bhagavad Gita, and there was some potency in that book given as a child, um, about six or seven, and I wanted to understand what was in that book. It was. Um, it was difficult because obviously I, there was no way I could comprehend the image. But the pictures and the, the cover and knowing the story of Krishna and Krishna, it was always fascinating. And um, the first program that we went to, I was one of the table class of Bhagavad Gita. It was almost like we were being in a movie. And I was completely sold on Krishna consciousness from that point. So I'd say that he was um, one of the great influences um, in keeping me in Krishna consciousness, um, my spiritual master, my family, my um, steadfast um, practice of, of devotional service, and many other wonderful um, devotees along the way. Association is so important. It's so important, so important. Um, there's no substitute for it. Uh, there was a lot of things I can tell you that I could have been doing that, you know, Krishna consciousness, um, you know, it evolved into what it is now because of all this experiences, but I wouldn't have gotten through them if it wasn't for the association of devotees. And um, Prabhupada's association in particular is an enough. Um, that's why I, I really wanted to um, mention him as an example, because that Lila Amrita to me in the time of the Bhagavad Gita was difficult to understand. 
that was my skill set. It was, you know, no matter how anxious your mind is or depressed or whatever you're going through, it's so easy to absorb yourself in that kind of thing about one's past lives. It's so real, but it's also so instructive. It's really descriptive. And um, it's one of those books that I've always gone straight from. So, yeah, that's and recently um, I've engaged in the Jewish diversity. You know, personally being engaged in the art service, it really um, it helps you come to that understanding of the thing that you first see. And uh, there isn't any subtlety that you can have um, afterwards. So that's that's what's been the same for me. It's been here in China, here in the world. That's the that's the thing. Thank you. Uh, Prabhu, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether you heard some of the comments. The sound was very, very uh, weak on my side. Prabhu, did you pick up some of the points, uh, Raghunath Bhatta Prabhu? It's very, very yeah, it is very low on my side also. I, so, you know. I, I, I didn't hear much, but I heard the, the Mataji saying that she was inspired by the, by the book, the pictures that got her attention. Yes. And she was attracted to an association and uh, Prabhupada mm -hmm. Lilamrita book, Mataji, is that true? The picture yeah. Prabhupada Lilamrita book that inspired you. Uh, so yeah. I caught a few points, but uh, I'm sorry to say that the sound is too low on my side, but it's I really sorry. admire but I hope we can have another class again, Madhuri, with the so you can ex explain some of the main points. We can learn so much from all your knowledge that you have. So basically, I can I can I can see that your your previous karma obviously landed you in a good family of pious, you know, devotee family. So I think you're very fortunate, Madhuri. And thank you so much to His Grace Sahagantha uh, Bhatta Prabhu for introducing you to us. We really appreciate it, Prabhu. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Madhuri, if you don't mind, if there's any more comments or questions, then we can, we'll just ask one more time if, if there's any more comments or questions from anybody. Uh, anybody wants to make any closing comments? Madhuri has some kirtan. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna, Madhuri, thank you. Please accept Mahabali Business of Prabhupada. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much for the service. Thank you for giving us the opportunity and Apologies about the sound. No, no, it's fine. So, Madhuri, you, you are in Indonesia at the moment, isn't it? Um, yeah, I was based in, uh, while serving in Indonesia, but currently I'm in Germany. Oh, no, we, are, we, we admire all the services you've done and all the causes. It's so nice that you're sharing with us also. You know, we, we are so grateful to you. Hare Krishna, Madhuri. Thank you. Um, so, this Bajan is by Jahu <laughs>
mind, just worship the Lord who feeds us the sun and water, which makes one thirst. Having obtained this rare human birth, pass over this ocean of world existence, root yourself nature and faith. Both in the day and the night, I remain sleepless, suffering the pains of the heat and cold, the wind and the rain. For a fraction of flickering happiness, I have useless return, wicked and what assurance of real happiness is there in all of one's wealth, youthfulness, sons, and family? This life is pottering like a drop of water on the ocean bed. Therefore, you should always serve and worship the divine being that brought you here. It is the desire and great longing of Govinda Das to engage himself in the life of service to others, namely hearing the glories of Lord Parikit and Constantly Serving the Lord's lotus feet, serving the Supreme Lord as a servant, worshipping him with flowers and incense, and so forth, serving him as a friend and supremely offering the Lord on the day of service. Hare Krishna Maji, thank you so much for the wonderful class. Thank you. Thank you. We'll end now. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.